afternoon, Grade 12s. It's fabulous to be this afternoon with you again. And I need to say from the onset that sometimes it gets very lonely in studio. So today, myself and Ross would like you to SMS, on, SMS us on 31498. But very recently, we had the quiz, the business studies quiz. And there, myself and Ross met so many of you. So a special welcome to Lotus River High, Lavender Hill High, Peakview High School, and Kensington High School was the winners of the quiz. Good afternoon, uh, Russ. Hi, Amanda. I'm Matrix. It's nice to actually see you back again. Um, all of you should be writing your prelims now. Um, we're going to be talking about investments um, as a topic today. It's one of those that you actually do need for your future. Understanding what you need to do with your money to actually grow it is a uh, a very useful skill that we do impart to you in business studies. So, well, let's get started. Um, I think, first of all, Amanda, I'd like to go to the overview. Right, I think everyone who's been watching Telematics knows I like giving you some idea of what we'll be doing and where everything fits in. Um, first of all, investment as a whole. At some stage, we're going to be talking about simple and compound interest right at the end. And um, different concepts you might come across that don't fit into the grand scheme of things, but you do need to understand. And we'll talk about things like a business investment. That is like buying into a business or maybe even starting a business. Um, we'll have types, we'll have advantages, disadvantages of that business investment, um, what risk factors you'll need to look out for, um, and then also what is a unit trust? What is the good things about it? What is the bad things, the pros and the cons? It's in, most of all, I find most learners have an issue with what is it exactly, and we're going to explain that to you. Um, we'll have government retail bonds. Um, what are the good? What is the bad? What is it exactly? Everything we're going to cover, um, all generally in what we call investment tools. Um, and then shares. Now, this is very important. Shares um, generally get very confusing, but we're going to go step by step. Um, what are the types of shares? The JSC, what, what do they do um, every day compared to selling shares, buying shares, etc.? Um, and what are the risk factors we want to look out for? So we're trying to explain each one of these business inventures, um, investments in terms of what are they high risk, low risk, medium risk, so that if you're able to get a question about explaining it, you're able to say, no, no, this is very low risk for me. I'm quite happy to invest in it. So that's just the overview. And right at the end, we'll just revisit it and just make sure we've done everything we need to do. Okay. Okay, so now in a business investment, you have a couple of things you need to understand. One is that it either is long term, okay, which often results in, in a better return, um, but you don't have access to it. That is the problem. We're talking about if you want money right now, you're not going to get it. You have to give them notice. You have to say, look, I need my money. Um, you get 32 day um, notice accounts. So it takes a long time. So your money grows quicker but you cannot get hold of it very quickly. Okay, so that is the downside, but examples of it are fixed deposit, unit trusts, and shares. Okay, so very good investment tools, but they do take some time to get that money back into your pocket. The other one we have is called a short-term investment. So if you're looking for short-term, you still want to get access to your money. Maybe you want to buy something in the short-term. You still need to use it. It's This is the options you're looking at. So. Your investment return, what you're getting back from them, is often lower, um, but you can get the money instantly. That's the sort of trade-off. Examples, bank account, um, money market account, all very quick access. I need my money now. Please, can I have my money? And they go, right, no, that's fine. But in return, we're going to give you a lower return, a lower return on my investment. Okay, so long-term and short-term. Great. Now we're going to move on. So how we go, Amanda? Yes, and today we're going to be looking at angel funding and venture capital. There is not very much difference between the two, but, but in advantages and disadvantages, it will be actually much more clearer. So angel funding refers to investors that offers financing to entrepreneurs for a share in the business. Often an entrepreneur has a bright idea, but they, often they don't have the funds that go with that. So in return, they go to an investor and they offer to finance them or to give them some startup capital for a share in the business. 
However, the risk for the investor is quite high with angel funding, even with venture capital as well, as there's no guarantee that, that they're going to be making a, that they're going to be earning any interest. So your venture capital refers to the funding given by individuals or organizations to start up and expand a business. The bigger difference between the two is with angel funding, the investor wants to share in the business. But yeah, with venture capital, they normally um, satisfied with you know a high interest rate. Then we're going to look at the advantages and disadvantages of angel funding. The advantages is there's no need for collateral. That is the personal assets, access to your investor sector's knowledge and contacts. There's better discipline due to the outside scrutiny, access to mentoring or management skills, and no repayments of interest. As we said, your investor has a share in the company. The disadvantages, it takes a long time to find a suitable investor that will support you, that will understand that there won't be any profits very soon. Then we have our venture capital. And business may obtain capital for expansion. There's no obligation to repay investors like a bank loan. However, the risk of the business is shared. And the major disadvantage is that the legal and the accounting cost is high. And the minute you have an investor, the investor must be consulted. I just quickly see as a messaging, New Orleans, I assume it's New Orleans in Paul, welcome to today's telematic session. And remember our SMS number is 31498. Ross? Okay, now when we're going to be talking about risk factors, we look at these five categories really. So we're looking at the investment period, is that long, is it short, what am I looking at? Can I get hold of my money is what I'm asking. What sort of tax implication? Do I get taxed a lot? It matters to me because that is money going out of my pocket. I want to know. It's part of my investment calculation. Does it beat inflation? Does it fall below? Because if it does, then it's not a good investment. Remember, inflation is very important when we're doing calculation. It's showing us our money is sort of losing a bit of value. If our investment isn't better than inflation, say, say, Inflation is 6%. If we're not getting 8%, we're still not making money. Our money is just losing value if it's at 6% as well. So we've got to make sure it's above inflation. We're also looking at what are the risks? You know, what risks? Could our business fail? Could our investment fail? What risk are we looking at? Now, I'm going to keep referring back to high, medium, and low risk because a bank account is low risk, whereas shares can go up, it can go down. We could lose the money. We don't know. There's a lot of risk involved, so we need to identify that. And lastly, our investment planning factors. Okay, so there's are five different ones. So each one of our investment tools we'll look at with these five different um, factors. Okay, so let's move on. So now this is our first one. This is with a business investment. So if we have a look, it is very really much long term. If you're going to invest in a business, you're not looking for a return tomorrow, next week, or even next month. You're looking a couple of years away, okay? Especially businesses who are just starting out. It takes a long time to get established. What sort of um, tax implication? Well, if they're issuing any dividends, we could look at 15%. And if you're in a partnership, that's just going to go on to your normal tax. So any profit you get paid out will go on to income tax. That makes a difference because now that could shoot you up into a whole different tax bracket and you're paying a lot more money. So investors want to know, am I signing into a partnership? If so, how much money could I look at? Is it going to make my tax higher? Am I really going to get money out of it is what they're asking themselves again. Okay, so important factor. Um, we have inflation, inflation rate. Well, initially the return is lower than the inflation rate because obviously the business takes time. But what's the bonus is that a business if it really kicks off we're talking about google we're talking about even um, the local coffee shop is that when it takes off there's a lot to actually gain out of it the profits can definitely beat inflation 
but that risk is very high. As you know, there's lots of coffee shops. You know, the odds of it not doing so well, very high, but if it does really well, that return is going to be very, very nice. Okay, so that's the actual risk. Um, what are we looking at in terms of liquidity? Well, the investment is unsecured. The business is starting. We can't really look for them to give us any sort of guarantees in that. Business isn't guaranteed. We can only do our research, go and look into the business, make sure that the person we're working with has all the right qualifications, that they're handling the money correctly, but there's no sort of guarantee. Um, I always tell my learners, if someone can guarantee you 30-40% and you don't even know about their business, it sounds very much like a pyramid scheme to me. So you've got to be very careful in where you're investing. So just something to think about. Our last one is investment planning factors. So like I said, you have to think, could this business fail? Well, if it's another coffee shop, yes, it could fail. There are lots of them. Um, you know, is it, gonna, is it ideal for me? Do I want my money tied up for years and years and years? Or am I looking for more of a short-term return? If you are the short-term person, this is not for you. This is for the person for the long run. And then lastly, what are those tax implications? Again, I'm just reiterating. The more money you're getting in in a partnership, the more you're going to have to pay in your own personal capacity and tax. Okay, well, that is our investment in a business. Now we're going to be looking at shares. Shares in the JSC, the Janisberg Securities Exchange. Um, take us away, Amanda. Okay, a share is part ownership of a company. Remember, if you're buying a share in a company, we're looking at public companies. Investors who buy shares are called shareholders. And a share certificate is issued to all shareholders indicating the number of shares purchased. Our shares is divided into three categories of shares. We have ordinary shares, preference shares, and then we have bonus shares. Your ordinary shares, your first category of shares says you have voting right to choose the board of directors. The value of the shares are determined by the profitability of the company. There is no guarantee of receipt of a dividend income or there is no stated dividend rate. So your ordinary shares, I repeat, is you have voting rights, number one. But number two, there is no guarantee of a dividend. Then the second type of shares are preference shareholders. Now the word preference means you will come first, you have first choice. Now your preference shareholders, in case dividends is declared, they will get their dividends first. And very often your preference shareholders will get a fixed dividend as well because there's different categories of preference shares that we get. So guaranteed to receive payment of dividend. The dividend is paid at a fixed amount of share or a fixed percentage. And at liquidation, that is if the company go bankrupt, the preference shareholders get paid out after the creditors, but before the ordinary shareholders. However, the preference shareholders have no voting rights except in matters that affects the payment of their dividend. However, Everything has an advantage and a disadvantage. Because your ordinary shareholders does not get a fixed dividend, when dividends are declared, their dividends is normally higher. Remember, Ross said the higher the risk, the greater the returns will be. Mm -hmm. Then we have your bonus shares. These are shares of stock given to current shareholders based upon the number of shares that a shareholder owns. Now, often what happened here, grade 12, is that in some years we cannot, we cannot declare a dividend because of the recession or things are tight. Then often in that years, the board of directors will make a decision to declare a bonus dividend, which means shareholders, especially ordinary shareholders, still get something in return. So while the stock action increased the number of shares owned, it doesn't increase the total value. But however, when dividends are declared, your, your total value of shares is going to be more, so the amount of dividends that you will receive will also be so much more as well. And then we move on. OK. 
Okay, now, um, so just remember, ordinary shares, very much vanilla, just plain preference. You get preference, you are going to get your money first, and your bonus is just a bonus. It's basically to keep the market a share very much similar when they give more shares. Now, we have advantages and disadvantages to um, shares. Now, obviously, you're going to get a much higher return. Um, I'm going to show you a slide of what it could look like after this, but there is so much that can come out of owning a share in a company. Remember, that company does well. Think Google, think Facebook, think any one of these companies. They make a lot of money. Now, getting declared a dividend there is definitely going to be in your benefit. So a much higher return that we're looking at. We're also looking at dividends are paid to shareholders only when they're declared. That could be kind of a bit trickier. I find that much more of a disadvantage sometimes. Um, and there is quite a bit of returns for your retirement. Most retirement funds or annuities are heavily invested in the share market. So the better that does, the better my retirement's looking. I'm, so I'm looking at a yacht instead of maybe a fishing boat. So <laughs> that's something to think about. The disadvantages are is that it can crash at any time. If you've been paying attention, there's things happening in China. Um, a couple of years back, we had the US economy go for a bit of a crash, and that affected both of their share markets. And not by a little bit, by lots. Um, we're talking numbers in billions of yen or dollars, depending where you're looking at. And it gets affected by the most oddest things. It could be, you know, a hurricane, a tsunami, even the tsunami that happened a while back, that affected share markets because now Japan couldn't produce certain goods and then somewhere else in the world where they bought goods from Japan, suddenly their shares didn't look so great. So it's so externally affected that sometimes it feels like it's a bit out of your control. But you have professionals and you can research it and do your best effort to sort of limit the risk as much as possible. Okay, now also you have the value of the share may actually drop below the initial price you bought it for. What does that mean? Is that if I bought that share for 50 Rand, so okay, I bought the share for 50 Rand, tomorrow it could be worth 25 Rand. I've lost 50% of the value overnight, and that can happen. Um, so it's something that can be worrying, and it's, I'm going to say it again with risk, high risk, high reward, but that risk is still there, so you need to be very, very careful. All right, Amanda, can we just go to the next slide? I just want you guys to see, okay, that's the one after this. Can we just go one, then we'll come back. Okay, this is what a share market kind of looks like. I know a lot of you haven't really seen it. Um, this is where shares go up and down. Now, as you can see, at some stage during that day, uh, it reached over 700, say, rands, but then dropped to 300 rands. Now, if you were the poor person who decided to buy at 700 rand per share, what's going to happen when it goes and dips down to 300 you've lost a lot of money but if you look at it it's starting to climb up again so this is how the share market kind of looks it has its ups it has its downs and the best investors in the world will always tell you it's over the long term that it does better now you can see from the beginning it started at 100 and even after the dip it still reached to 600 so that's kind of what you're looking at. That's why we're talking about fluctuations, ups and downs. There's no guarantees. There's a lot of risk. But as you can see, there's a lot of reward. All right, I think let's go back, Amanda, and then we can talk about um, and analyze all these risks. You know, Ross, I think South Africans are, especially in their personal capacity, they mm. don't often buy shares. I find that there's more big corporates that buy shares. Mm, um, I would tend to agree with you. I think that's mainly because a lot of individuals are scared of the share market. There's a lot of big words. There's a lot of figures, and it's very difficult. But in we've actually this country has a lot of different things that make it easier. I mean, if you're part of F and B, you can buy shares. Yeah, because I, I, I'm just thinking. Look at your your telecommunication industry. Look at your MTN and and Virgin Mobile. Imagine having a share in one of those companies. They're doing quite well at the moment, so it could do. Yeah, but again, you have to do your research. Something we need to think about mm -hmm. when my put come in. Okay, just one back, Amanda. Okay, okay, there we go. So this is the risks that we're going to have a look at. Now, this is for shares. Okay, so we did the business. Now we're going to look at shares. Um, we consider this very much a medium to long term. Like I said to you, it is medium to long term. It is not overnight. I mean, you always see in the movies where they go mm -hmm. like, wow, we made billions overnight. There are rare stories, but at the end of the day, it is a much of a patience game more than anything else. 
Okay, so um, may be sold at any time except for BE shares that must be kept for a certain period of time. Um, that was just an agreement made. So you can sell your shares anytime you want to, as long as maybe you've made a profit. Tax, tax implications, dividends tax at 15%. And we have this thing called capital gains tax that is payable. So if your share was started at 100 Rand and suddenly it rose to 200, you gained some value out of that and a portion of that is taxed. Um, we'll bring that back when we talk about some concepts you should understand. So you're getting taxed on the money that they're declaring. Yeah, we've declared a dividend. Yeah, take some money. We're going to tax you a little bit of that. That goes to the government, but you're still getting money out of your share. Um, I sell my share. And then, all right, now my share's gone up. I still got to pay my little bit of money to the government. It's part of it. It's capital gains tax. The capital has now gained something. We'd like to tax you on that, please. And off that goes to government. Right. Um, inflation rate, how does it do? Well, most times it does beat inflation and quite nicely. I mean, we're talking inflation sitting at roughly 6% round about there. And shares can often be 14 up to 20 odd, depending. So very much an inflation beater because it keeps up with the market. So your markets do well, shares do better, of course you're going to beat inflation. Okay, so now also we want to look at the risk. Now again, um, th th you have limited liability when it comes to the debt of the company, um, but you could lose pretty much your investment. So it is a bit of a risk um, that you have to look out for. And again, depending on the type of share, the company, the bigger companies we consider low to medium risk, whereas the startup companies can be very much high risk. You want to maybe be do your research, but then one day Google was a startup company. So just as long as you do your research, often these things can be a lot more clearer to you. And what you'll see later in the JSC is there's a lot of regulations to actually list on the JSC. So they're trying to help you by making sure that company is doing what they should be doing before you, the, low, the public, actually buy the share. So yeah, we actually have a lot of good things running for us. What are the investment planning factors we have to look at? Again, is liquidity, the ability to actually get cash out of this. Um, out of my experience buying shares, Amanda, <laughs> is that it's not instantly available. You're not looking at, I'd like my money tomorrow. It takes a while. So. It's not immediately accessed, but it's a lot better than a 32-day account or something like that. There are tax issues that do fall on you. The, the company generally takes the dividends tax, but your capital gains now falls on you. And um, yeah, you get dividends every year, hopefully. Um, some of the very good performing shares, you could look at quite a nice dividend. And if you buy enough, every year you're getting a nice bit of the pie. So that's the benefit. That's the strength of that investment. It's not only the dividend I'm getting, my share is slowly gaining in price. Okay, so again, five different things you need to look at. But again, shares, I would say, is more medium to low risk. So think about that. So if I ever, ever get asked, you say no. Depending on the factors, low to medium risk. Okay, let's move on. I promise you, Ross, I'll think about it. <laughs> now, investments in shares is a very good way forward. Just before you carry on with unit trust, Great 12s, I'm sure you must be watching us. We would love a message from you. Our SMS number is 31498. I don't believe that you, none of you have data over there. Okay. Well, let's move on to unit trusts. Um, the best way I can describe a unit trust to any one of you as learners is that you have, a, you have, say, a rugby team or a soccer team. Okay, so you have a whole rugby team. Some of you in one match do well, and some of you do not so well. You do poorly. Um, but as a team, you're able to perhaps win the game. This is kind of the idea behind a unit trust. We will have a lot of people investing, thousands. We're not talking like 10 or 20. We're talking lots of people, a lot of people investing. And a very much a professional, a fund manager, someone who knows what they're doing, who does the research for you, goes, all right, let's take all that money, we'll put a little bit here, a little bit here, a little bit here, and so this is your player one, player two, player three, and if this one does well, great, the team is doing well so far. This one does well, there, the team's doing even better, but if the third player doesn't do so well, 
the whole team is still on the uptrend. So that's what I can explain in Unitrust to you. It's spreading the risk, buying lots of different shares, a lot of different people involved, and through that sort of multiple pies, multiple investments, you're generally looking at a steady increase. Okay, so if a couple do bad, that's all right. The next year they do better, but on the whole trend, you're looking at an upward trend. Okay, that is a unit trust. Just to go back to the slide. Okay, so unit trust, like I said, pulls together a lot of investments, a lot of different people. And then eventually, all those different people get broken down into units um, that have value according to maybe a number of shares in different companies. And again, some are high, some are low, but generally, they spread the risk for you. What's the key thing here? We have a fund manager. There is someone qualified, someone doing the hard work, researching, and actually doing that for you so that your fund can increase. And trust me, they're not doing it for free. They get commission and everything else. And so to them, the better the fund does, the more commission they get. So yeah, that's the whole idea behind it. I think the whole idea behind unit trust is you do not put all your eggs into one basket. Exactly. That's <laughs> the, that is a good analogy. Okay, so now, Amanda, take us away on the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, your advantages of your unit trust, it says, allows the investor to buy a group of shares and securities from a variety of companies. As Russ has said, you will have a fund manager. So what your fund manager will do, you tell your fund manager that you have 50,000 Rand. He'll take the 50,000 Rand, he will buy shares in a, in the banks, you know, shares in your different banks, in your insurance companies, a little bit in the mining industry, a little bit in telecommunication, because the different uh, sectors of business will do different They'll be different, they'll be more successful at different times. If retailers feel in the pinch of the recession, you will find that your, your banks is more secure. If uh, the car sell, if the car sales are dropping and the car industry, the shares is not viable there, you know the shares will always be viable in telecommunication. So the key is to get a good fund manager that will, you know, that will set the tone for you. Some individuals are brave enough to do this on their own, but as they say in the wrestling world, rather get a professional to do this for you. <laughs> it lowers the potential risk. It spread the risk among some high risk and some low risk investment. And it provides a good source of income on the retirement. The idea is while you're still working, you need to put money away for that days of leisure that awaits you. The disadvantages we're looking at, your unit trust could decrease in value over time, but the likelihood of that happening is much less than the likelihood of it increasing over time. Depends on the growth of your blue chip companies, external factors that could impact negatively on the value of your unit trust. Your external factors is things like political stability, the recession, inflation rate, but I must say in South Africa, we've been very blessed. If I look at uh, the Netherlands and Denmark and all those countries are negatively, they've been impacted with the recession, the banks in, and that's in, and even now what's happening in China the last week. We in South Africa, we've been very, very stable, mm -hmm. much more stable than the rest of the continent and even the rest of the, um, just the rest of the international countries. Okay. Uh, okay, now we have government retail bonds. Now the idea here being I give money to government, they do something with it. Um, unbeknown to me, the only thing that I want really out of it is I'd like my interest please. And what's great, interest is payable twice a year at a very much fixed rate, but you need to have a minimum amount that is either investment over two, three or five years. So it's not really accessible immediately. It's one of those long-term investments we talked about. Um, but what's great is that it's backed by government. There's a lot of weight behind that. Um, so it's a very safe form of investment. And remember, safe doesn't always mean not so much of a high return. It's a fair return, which is good if you want to grow your money slowly. Okay, so if I go to the next slide, please. So that's a government retail bond. So the positives and negatives, very safe. I mean, you've got the government backing you. You're quite safe. 
guaranteed returns versus maybe declare a dividend, maybe sell your share. A lot of maybes involved there. There's guaranteed returns. No extra costs or commission. Um, and you can just go to the post office and purchase what you need. The low side is that it's not much of a return and it's considered because it is low risk at the end of the day. I told you, high risk, high return. If you like a very safe investment like a bank account, you cannot expect a high return. It's going to be lower. Um, what could happen, and it's very, very much on the unlikely side of things, is that if there's an event of a war or a major economic meltdown, um, the government could default. We're talking like Greece um, situation at the moment. Um, that could be not a great government retail bond to buy at the moment. So again, it's doing your homework. Is the country that you're buying from doing well? Is there a lot of policies in place to ensure growth? Again, you must do your homework when it comes to investing um, for that. But government retail bonds on a whole, safe um, and sort of a guaranteed slow return. Okay, so good to put maybe quite a bit of money there just to grow it slowly. Okay. I must say I prefer this one. Maybe oh. I'm just very cautious and keep things safe. But I like the idea of a, you know, a guaranteed return twice yeah. a year. It does. It's a good idea to put some money here so that you can slowly beat inflation and get your money slowly growing. But if you, you still need to have that high risk to really punch through a nice big capital gain. Otherwise, you are going to be sitting around for hundreds of years. <laughs> okay, now this is the JSC. Now, Amanda's going to take us through it now. I just want to quickly put it out there. This is a picture of the Janusburg Stock Exchange. Now, you guys are going, but, sir, we learned about Securities Exchange. Well, yes, it's Janusburg Securities Exchange or Stock Exchange, depending on whichever textbook you're having a look at. Um, both are considered a right to call it. Um, what you can also see in that picture is a picture of a bear and a bull. Now, in stock trading and markets, you have what they call a bear market and what you call a bull market. When things are selling fast and people are making money, they call it a bull market because as a bull runs through, it's quick, lots going on, selling, selling, buying, selling, lots going on. When we talk a bear market, I want to hold. When a bear hibernates, when it goes to sleep for a very long time, it waits. And that's what I'm doing. I'll buy a share and I'll wait. And I'll wait for that share to eventually go up. But in a bull market, I'm buying, I'm selling. The shares are going up and down, up and down, and I'm selling quick, quick. Okay, so just something for you. I've just encountered on some of my two todays that that term bull and bear hasn't been totally clarified. Okay, so Amanda, take us through the JSC. I must say that is the best explanation of <laughs> bull and bear market I've heard, Ross. Absolutely. Your J's is your formal market. Now remember, all public companies must be listed on the J's E. That's one of your characteristics of the public company and make it so different to the private company. So your J's E allows individuals and organizations, that's other companies, to buy and sell shares in an organized and controlled manner from listed public companies. So stockbrokers act as your intermediary between the buyers and the seller of shares. So if you, if I want to buy shares, I would need to see a stockbroker and my stockbroker will be the intermediary. As the stockbroker will buy the shares from the company that I need. Then we have a concept or the acronym that says TRAIT, which, which means shares transaction totally electronic. It's an electronic method that is used in the buying and selling of shares. It's almost like e-commerce and buying shares online. Okay, I think I'll take this one, Amanda. Okay, I just need to say, Ross, in the last few years, this question has been very, very popular. Mm. Since the new CAP curriculum, this question has been extremely popular. Okay, so well, let's go through it slowly. These are all the functions of the JSC. And if you think about it, it is just a way of regulating the industry. Remember to keep you safe. I talked about it earlier. They want to try and make sure that you're not investing in bogus companies. So, first of all, they serve as a link between the investor and the company that you want to buy shares from. So, they're, they're that in-between person, the intermediary, the stockbroker. They serve as sort of a barometer. Most markets around the world, 
if they start doing badly, it shows in their stock market. So like I talked about, um, when we had the China crisis, they could see it in the stock market and they could see the economy was going down and that stock market was a barometer. It was an indication that something was going down, or something was going wrong. Um, so it serves as that function as well. It, in most countries, if the stock market's doing well, people want to invest, they, they think it's safe. So very important function they serve. They're showing the world, look, we're doing well or we're not doing so well. Okay, so they serve as a barometer. They encourage the investor, investor to invest in the economy of a country. They basically put out advertisements. They are always going around trying to get investments. They allow financial institutions to invest surplus funds. What does that mean? Any extra cash that a financial institution like insurance, like banks, um, if they have extra funds, they put it into the stock market. And remember, they want to beat inflation. They're just like you. They want to take the money that they have in surplus or extra and they want to grow it, and they want to grow it more and more. Because remember, the more they grow it, the more profit they have. So they're just as keen as the average investor to make profit grow. Okay, um, reflects the true value of the shares. Now, what does that mean? At the end of the day, that stock market is changing continuously. It is always flickering. The stockbrokers have to keep a very keen eye. Is it up, it's down, where is the price? Um, do yourself a favor, go onto the, the JSC, and you can actually see it moving up and down during um, the trading hours. So it's live. They say it's live. It's not starts in the morning, that's the price it roughly is. It changes hour by hour, minute by minute. Okay, so it's a live system. Shares are published daily. I hope a lot of um, educators are showing um, their learners this. I show my learners this all the time. Go pick up any newspaper. Have a look in the business section. Go find the JSC section and there's a whole bunch of numbers and a whole bunch of companies and you can actually look at every single one and how they're doing. Okay, so they list it, they're showing, they're trying to spread the news, showing how a company's doing and they're trying to encourage me, you, to invest in the different companies. Okay, so those are their functions. Very important, they're a regulator. They want to try and get things the same across the industry. Okay. Now, these are some investment concepts. Um, we have debentures. We have that thing called a dividend and capital gains tax and simple interest and compound interest. Amanda, why don't you take us away on debentures? Okay, your debentures, I always think of a debenture as an IOU. Your debenture is not an owner of the company. It's a creditor of the company. And the minute it's a creditor, we're talking about borrowed capital. So debenture is a medium to long-term debt instrument used by large companies to borrow money at a fixed rate of interest. The difference between a debenture and a share and a share at least is like a shareholder buys a share in the company and becomes an owner of the company. A debenture holder buys a debenture in the company and becomes a creditor of the company because the company in essence owes the debenture holder money. So it works on a very similar concept. The difference is your shareholder will get a dividend and your debenture holder will get an interest. Then the next one is our favourite is the dividend. A share of the after-tax profit of a company distributed to its shareholders according to the number and type of shares held. Remember your preference shareholders will get their shares first at a fixed rate, and your ordinary shares holders will only get dividends when dividends are declared, but at a much, much higher rate. Earlier, Ross explained the capital gain tax to you. This is tax payable on profit made on the sale of a capital asset. For example, if we sell in our house, and especially if you have a second or a third dwelling, and we sell our house and then we make a profit. A certain percentage of that profit is taxable. And that tax we call capital gain tax. It's because we have been buying property and selling property with the idea to make a profit. That is why a certain percentage of that is due to SARS. And from here, Russell will take us through the simple interest and the compound interest. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, just a quick note on debentures and dividends. Often the company has to pay out those uh, debentures before. Oh, yes. Yeah, so that's where the one of the pros is, is that a debenture has to be paid out before we declare any dividends. So they get their money first, which is a bonus. Okay, we're going to talk about simple interest and compound interest. Now, I'm going to say this straight off the bat. One, um, I know a lot of you do maybe maths and math literacy. There are different formulas. That's That's fine. Whichever formula you're comfortable with, use it the only thing i'll say is we're going to go through examples with the ones that are in business studies and that you just must show you your sort of working out don't just put an answer we need if it's for six marks i can't give you six marks if you don't show me how you got to your answer so show all the working out show me the answer and show me the effect okay so a lot of steps involved we're going to do a couple of practice questions so that you understand what i'm talking about Okay, so simple, straightforward. There's um, calculated on what I put in, which is called the principal, and it's just simple. It's on the same amount every year. It doesn't include the interest that I accumulate. So it's just straightforward. 10,000 Rand, 10%, 1,000 Rand a year, straightforward. Compound, however, takes in uh, this year 10%, next year's 10% on my principal and the interest. So it's always adding, it's compounding. It's adding every single year. Where simple is, you paid me this, I'm paying you this. Straightforward. Okay, let's go on to the examples. Oh, yes, and just to say, grade 12, your simple interest and your compound interest. Question 3, which is ventures, you will either get one or the... You won't get both. They won't ask you to do both calculations, but often it's one or the two. You'll either be asked to calculate simple interest or you'll be asked to calculate compound interest. And later, if we come to the question and answer sessions, we have slides to show you how they could possibly ask it in section A. And now the question will look in section B. Okay, so now one click at a time. That is the formula we use for simple interest. Okay, I equals P, which is principal. That's what I'm putting in, the principal amount, the starting amount, um, times the rate times the time how long am i investing for okay so that's the formula straightforward i ask you the question you write down the formula so i know that you know the formula you have to show me that's part of that whole six marks so show me the formula and then we move on amanda so that's the formula i've done it for you you've got the principal amount what was the original amount that i put in uh, we have the interest rate expressed as a percentage very important so i'm going to show you what i mean by that and then we have the time. How long? How many years? Years and months? Decades? We don't know. So that's how long my investment's been in. Okay, one more quick commander. This is the type of question you could be looking at. Um, Donovan invest 100,000. Okay, 100,000 is the principal. That is what I put into the bank. And it was for 54 months. Okay, so that's our time. And the bank says, you know what? We're going to offer you simple interest at a rate at 11% PA per annum, per year. That's what PA stands for, per year. So now you must calculate the amount of interest that Donovan will receive after 54 months. And as a nice educator, I tell you, I remind you, show all workings. Okay, so just before we move on, when you get this question, highlight all the important information. I find a lot of learners get lost because when you're looking at words over and over and that three-hour exam gets a bit drawn out, you need some color. You need to underline important facts so that your mind stays sharp and you can actually draw that information out and use it. Because if you don't, then often you miss even small details. So it's a good thing to do. Take a highlighter, pen, underline what you need to underline. Okay, so let's move on, Amanda. Now, this is kind of what you should have been. So one, I show my formula. Two, I show my working out. 100,000 Rand was my principal. Why are we dividing 11 by 100? Because I want to get it as a percentage. So 0 0.11, right, is 11%. If I put 1 there, it's 100%. Okay, so as a percentage, divide by 100, get it as a percentage. And 54, divide by 12. Why 12? 12 months in a year. We want it per year. Okay, so... 100,000, original amount, times by 11%, correctly shown, 0.11, times 4.5 years. 
And what interest do I get? I get 49,500. Okay, step by step. Okay, so show everything. Um, these type of questions often are, you know, multi-layered. So just keep, sh make sure that you're doing it step by step. Okay, that is simple interest. Let's move on to now the big brother or the big sister of that, compounded. Okay, now the formula is S equals P, principal, 1 times I, interest, times N. How long am I invested for you? Now, um, this is how you generally look work investments out. If you were Donovan and you went for the simple interest, you haven't done your homework. You haven't realized the power of compounded interest. Okay, Amanda, let's move on to that just broken down. Principal, original amount is the P. I, your interest rate. And N, how long am I actually in this investment for? Okay, so let's look at that question. Let's see. Say we have Jubal invested 50,000 Rand. Okay, so it's half of what Donovan invested for three years. So if I had a highlight, I'd be underlining 50,000. I'd be underlining three years at an interest rate of 10% compounded annually. Calculate the amount of interest that you'll receive after three years. Again, as an educator, I'm reminding you, show all workings. Okay, so you should have underlined 50,000 for three years at an interest rate of 10 that is all the information I need to pull out of there. Okay, let's see what old job we actually got. Now, take my formula. I write it down because I want to see, I want to show the markers that I know which formula I'm using. And again, use whichever formula works for you, but show it so that we know which method you're using. Okay, so 50,000 Rand went in. Um, 1 plus 0 0.1. Why 0 0.1? because that is 10%. Again, remember, 10 divided by 100, 0 0.1, times by three, three years. Now, some questions sometimes get a bit tricky and they will say 36 months. They will say 54 months. You need to make sure you put it into year terms. Okay, so just, it might be a small step that might trip you up, just slowly go through it. I want it in years. Okay, so putting all my numbers and look at that. In a three-year period, he ended up with 66,550. Okay, he's definitely, with a smaller amount of money, managed to gain much more of a return in relation to simple interest. Okay, so you as learners are finally seeing that compounds can actually gain so much more than simple. Simple is old school. We want compounded. Our money must grow. It's a tree. It's growing on top of more growing. We're not just going back to the start every single time. Okay, so now you know compound, very important. Compound can do so much in the long term. We talk retirement funds, all of them compounded interest. Okay, so those are the two types that you could get. Like I've shown you in the form of a case study, they want you to draw the information out and apply it to the formula that we give you. Okay, very important. All right, so let's move on. Ah, so interest earned, there we go. Now overview. Now the overview, like I said before, just to recap, we talked about simple compound, we talked about concepts, we talked about business investments, types, disadvantages, disadvantages, we, looked, we talked about the five risk factors for both investing in a business, investing in unit trusts, investing, um, what is the pros and cons of government retail bonds, we talked about the risk factors in shares. We talked about the different types of shares. Ordinary. Remember, vanilla, they can vote, but they're not going to get their money first. The preference guys are going to get it first. We talked about a bonus share that's getting a surprise. You're getting more shares. We talked about that Janisberg Security slash Stock Exchange. What do they do? What are their functions? So everything related to investing. Okay, now we're definitely going to do some questions. Uh, no, Ross, we don't actually, we're almost at the end of the broadcast. Mm -hmm. However, I just need to acknowledge Bishu High School in the Eastern Cape. We got your message. Welcome to the program. Grade 12, as Ross intimated earlier, everyone is busy with the prelim exams. You at school for the next three weeks. 
And in many schools, some of the matriculants leave at that time. We have the spring holiday coming up. And the spring holiday just means it's spring school for the grade 12s because grade 12s, you don't have the luxury of having a holiday and not working at all. You need to be putting in all the extra time. Your prelim exams will give you an idea how well you are doing in business studies. We're starting our final exams within 40 days. The countdown has started literally grade 12. So yes, the pressure is on. Yes, you, you need to be working. From myself and Ross, we want to wish you the very best for this exams. We want to wish you the very, this is our last session today with you. We want to wish you the best for the upcoming mock, not the upcoming final exams as well. And make the best of it, Great 12. Seize the moment, seize the day, work hard. Your matric result is like a bad ID photo. It stays with you for the rest of your life, right, Ross? It does. So you want to do your best to make sure that that matric result actually reflects your ability. And often it's that last stretch that gets a bit, a bit tricky for you at the end of the day. So you must, if anything, pull out all the stops, do old papers, go over all the work. Don't leave anything up to, I'll wing it, or I, I hope I do okay, or I hope the paper is better or easier, because you should be hoping that that paper is hard so that you can have the challenge. Um, don't wait for that exam. Prepare yourself and go forward and actually meet that exam and do the best you can. Old papers are brilliant, so you can you get used to the questions. You can get used to how you should be answering. You should get used to, you know, the length of a paper. That's where a lot of my learners, and I think a lot of learners generally, the length of a paper can really knock you. You need to be very aware. It's three hours. You need to put your head down, and you don't have really time to sit and wonder about things. You just need to focus, read the question, get the facts, move on. Otherwise, you won't finish the paper. And I also think it's so essential as you prepare for the exam, grade 12s, your friend in the question paper is your essay questions. Remember, you marked according to Flazo, that is 32 marks of facts, two marks for your layout. You need to write the word introduction. You need to have two sentences under your introduction. You need to have a conclusion. For your analysis mark, you need to have that headings. You need to cite two examples, relevant examples referring to a business name, because this is where you can score marks grade 12. So all that is left to say is good luck grade 12. Oh, God bless you. Have a fabulous 2015 what is left of it. Mm, goodbye, yes. Enjoy. Good luck. Mm -hmm.